Great. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, really excited to have you here today. Um, oh, let me um, do my camera. Uh, I don't know if that will add to the experience or detract from it, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> we'll do it. Um, awesome. Um, if this is your first time joining us, uh, welcome. Um, if this is um, a not your first time, welcome back. Uh, my name is Michael Franti. I head Product marketing here at Portworks um, have been at Portworks by Pure Storage. I'm um, gonna have been with Portworks for um, just about four years now. And prior to that was at another uh, container storage company. So I've been around uh, the block and wanna share some of that, that um, knowledge and information with you today. Uh, we're talking about OpenShift and I'm joined by my colleague, Brian Walner, um, who is our awesome technical marketer um, who can kind of under, explain everything from how to use Portworks to how to architect uh, solutions using on OpenShift. He's both, you know, a um, an evangelist and also a user of technology. We were really lucky to hire Ryan from uh, from a job where he's building systems like this. So, um, uh, welcome, Ryan. Thanks, Michael. Excited. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. We're a couple minutes out after the hour. I see folks still filtering in. Um, but you know, these are always recorded. So, um, you know, if you join late or just joining now, um, you can always go back and listen to the recording. So, um, so let's dive in. Cause we actually have a lot to talk about. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's like, you know, as parents, which of your children is your favorite? Well, you know, I'm never going to tell you which one is my favorite, but right. We all, we all have favorites. No, we don't. But, um, Portworks runs on any platform, any Kubernetes platform. So we have customers running on. AKS and EKS and IKS and GKE and Rancher and Platform 9 and of course OpenShift. And I'm not going to say which one is my favorite, um, but OpenShift is really great. Um, and we love when customers run on OpenShift um, because, you know, in the enterprise, uh, it's really seen as a platform that, that is, you know, mature enough and stable enough and scalable enough to run those really, really important enterprise applications. Um, and those apps, you know, they just have requirements around data protection, backup, and DR, and security uh, that Portworks specializes in. So when we see a customer that's running on OpenShift, we just, you know, we, we think that that's an offer, awesome opportunity um, to help that customer um, accelerate their app modernization, bring more workloads into, into containers, leverage more automation, um, and really make the best use of the Portworks platform as, as a way to accelerate that process. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk all about um, how Portworks fits into your OpenShift environment. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I like to start always by, by framing this. And if this is, you've been to one of these before, you've seen these slides, uh, but don't worry, I'll go quick because, you know, this, this should just, I, this should be your worldview already. If, if you're here listening to this, to this, um, to this office hours, um, you understand the importance of data um, and how it really is transforming how businesses are run and how customers are 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 one, how customers are satis satisfied. Um, now, then the question isn't, you know, is data important? Of course it is. The question is, well, how do we actually build platforms that enable us? to process that data into value and insight. And increasingly, um, people are recognizing that, that application platforms um, like OpenShift or Kubernetes more broadly with containers, when combined with agile uh, DevOps practices, um, uh, new processes like CICD can radically accelerate how quickly um, we can build and run applications and the scales at which we can build and run those applications. Um, so that's, that, that's why we're here today talking about OpenShift because, you know, most new applications are being developed in containers um, and because we're not running them in any single environment anymore, um, we need a, a platform that can run across environments like OpenShift. Um, but, and there's, all, there's always a catch, there's always a gotcha. Um, as great as solutions like OpenShift and containers are, um, they don't address the storage and data management requirements that enterprises have, at least not in a way that is truly automatable, truly scalable, truly turnkey, right? You know, given enough time and resources, you can cobble together anything with anything, 
right? It's not whether or not we can build kind of a, um, a proof of concept that solves these problems. The question is whether or not when push comes to the shove in a true production environment where we're scaling rapidly, right? We have customers and you may have experienced this yourself who in one week um, in March of 2020 scaled as much as they scaled the entire previous year, right? That, that's an, that is a, a generational scaling event. And the only way that that's possible when you're talking about stateful applications is using technologies, yes, like um, like containers and container orchestration, but also systems like Portworks that address those um, critical requirements around DR, uh, backup, uh, recovery, data security, high availability, et cetera, folks, wrong direction. So that's what we do. Um, and we do it for customers that are running on OpenShift, um, in any number of environments, public cloud, private cloud, uh, using lots of different um, infrastructure in those environments, some bare metal, um, some, you know, some VMware, some you know, pure storage, some, some NetApp, some Dell EMC, we're completely agnostic to the underlying storage la layer. Um, and the fact that we can provide and solve these enterprise requirements for truly mission critical applications running in an automated manner on Kubernetes environments uh, is why Portworks um, has been named the leader in Kubernetes storage and Kubernetes data protection uh, by GigaOM um, in two different reports. That they did the most comprehensive view um, study of this market um, and hopefully you'll understand why Portworks was named the leader um, as we go through the rest of the presentation and then Ryan um, uh, takes, takes Portworks for a spin on OpenShift. Um, you know, some of the customers that we support um, are you know, really some of the largest and most sophisticated users of containers generally in the world. Um, and, you know, the reason I bring this up is because, you know, your use cases are, are, are really important. They're high scale. Well, we've seen other customers that have similar use cases, similar levels of scale. And between Portworks and our partners, we can provide a comprehensive solution for that. Um, and, that and that absolutely um, is the case on OpenShift. We are, we are certified on OpenShift. We're available. In, um, the, uh, in the operator hub, in the container catalog. If you're, you're, if you're buying OpenShift through IBM, you can, um, you can acquire Portworks through the IBM catalog. I mean, there are OpenShift offerings. We're a really native solution um, in addition to providing all the features and functionality that you're looking for. Um, so what is Portworks? Well, Portworks is a platform that allows you to run any stateful application on OpenShift or any other um, uh, Kubernetes distribution uh, in any cloud on any infrastructure, right, that's both, you know, bare metal or virtualized, as well as any storage infrastructure, right? We love it when our customers run in pure storage, but hey, if you want to run us on um, uh, on HPE, if you want to run us on Dell or IBM, if you want to run us on NetApp, then we can create the best container experience for you on those storage systems as well. Uh, and we do that across all the stages of the application lifecycle. Um, you know, the, the core of our platform um, are uh, six modules that, that do what they sound like, right? PX Store is our container granular storage um, engine, and, and Ryan is going to show some demos of this and how we do things like, um, you know, uh, uh, snapshots of container volumes, restores, things like that. Uh, we also do high availability, and all of this is truly at enterprise scale, right? You know, we have customers that are running hundreds of thousands of volumes. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's 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 one thing to do some functional testing and find out that yeah your your solution can you know provision a volume and make it available to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's another thing to do that at scale, and that's where Portworks excels. Uh, but we also know that just running things don't always go perfectly, right? Um, you also have to think about data protection. So we offer a comprehensive backup and restore solution for OpenShift. Um, the same for DR, including up to zero RPO disaster recovery between completely independent data centers. And I have both a slide and a case study to talk about on OpenShift. Um, we understand that applications move around. That can be between clusters uh, within a data center as you upgrade, say, from OpenShift 3.x to 4.x. Um, or it could be between uh, clouds or on-prem data centers. We handle that with PX Migrate, migrating not just your data volumes, but also all of your application configuration. Um, security, uh, it's not even a question of whether our apps need to be secure. Of course they do. And that's why we provide container granular encryption for all of your applications running on OpenShift. Um, and PX Autopilot is really about the automated capacity management. Um, 
So Forks, you know, we, you can think of us as an accelerant for your digital transformation, right? Your know, customers that adopt Forks, they tend to see four big benefits. One is they just move you know, tremendously faster. T-Mobile is a great example of that. They went from, you know, to an app taking six months uh, to deploy globally to being able to do it in just hours when they added Forks into the mix. Um, uh, one of our customers, Esri, uh, you know, they had to scale to unprecedented uh, levels with the COVID crisis, and they were able to do that thanks to the flexible solution that we built together. Um, RBC, that I'll talk about more in a minute, was able to really accelerate their adoption of OpenShift because they could now handle data protection use cases. Um, and Audi was able to get all of that and more um, while saving up to 60% on their stores built from Amazon. So it's really, uh, it's, it's speed, it's agility, it's reliability, but then it's also cost savings and what could be better than that. Um, yeah, I talked a little bit about RBC and I think this is a particularly instructive use case because um, Royal Bank of Canada, we did a webinar with them recently and um, they're a big OpenShift um, uh, um, customer and they love OpenShift. And you know what we see with our customers is when you get a taste of the reliability and the automation and the agility that containers and Kubernetes bring to your organization, it, it's like a black hole that sucks in applications. You want all of your applications to benefit from that automation and that agility. Um, and, and RBC was in that exact same case. They said, what else can we run on OpenShift? Um, and some of their applications, not surprisingly, right, being in financial services, had DR requirements. And um, not to spend too much time, event, time on it, because I want to get over to Ryan's demo, we solved disaster recovery on OpenShift for RBC that enabled them to bring more applications to the OpenShift platform so that they could be more agile, so that they could increase their, their, their um, application delivery rates even more. And I think that's, that's the magical better together story with Portworks and OpenShift. When you bring Portworks into your OpenShift cluster, you can run more applications on OpenShift and benefit from that agility and that automation and that reliability that containers bring, but not sacrifice the business requirements that you have around data protection, DR, security, and more. Um, so, you know, when you think about where does Portworks fit, fit into my OpenShift journey? Well, you know, we support all of the use cases that we really see um, OpenShift driving, whether that's you know big data, fraud detection, search, um, AI and ML, um, edge and IoT, offering database as a service, um, or doing data science. And what does that specifically mean? Well, these apps and more are underlying all of those use cases, right? We might be using Couchbase um, to an, um, to analyze um, um, you know logs. Uh, that are potential, you know, red flags from a fraud perspective, or we're using TensorFlow as part of our, you know, AI and ML modeling, or we're using Elasticsearch to rebuild the search experience for our public-facing website. So each of those meta use cases has a variety of data services under the hood, um, and those services run as containers on top of OpenShift, um, and they need high availability, performance, security, data protection, and that's exactly what we provide for these specific applications and more. Um, you know, and I mentioned this before, but I really want to underline, you know, think about OpenShift as a black hole for applications in a good way, right? In a good way. Understand what I mean by that. Thing it, that the, the agility and the speed that you get once things come onto OpenShift is so compelling that the question is, what else can we bring to the platform, right? That, that's the gravitational attraction of OpenShift. Um, and so you need to think about not just your requirements today, but what are your requirements next quarter and next year? And that's why it's really important to understand that Portworks can grow with you no matter how big your OpenShift cluster um, uh, gets. You're not going to run into problems when you are scaling. Um, so a couple of quick features. Um, PX Migrate um, is how you can move applications um, between OpenShift clusters um, in an on-premise environment, right? This is a give you the example of upgrading from 3.x to 4.x. Uh, you can also move those applications, say your, your, you have a, your, your containerization work is part of a cloud migration. Well, you can migrate from on-prem uh, to the public cloud, and I'm showing here that we're moving to a different scheduler, uh, but it can be OpenShift running in all of those environments. Um, the point being, we're gonna move your apps and your data 
between the uh, between the environments. Um, you know, we deliver high availability in a um, in an OpenShift cluster running in any one of those environments. So you can deploy something like MySQL, um, and Portworx is going to uh, create a replica of your MySQL volume on some other host in your cluster. And so if I lose that initial host, then we can actually tell OpenShift where to reschedule that application, right? In this case, where is my replica? Is it an AZ1 or AZ2 or AZ3? Well, we can tell OpenShift where it is um, to reschedule that container so that you maintain hyperconvergence, you maintain the absolute best performance possible within your OpenShift environment. And this is completely automated and transparent to you, the user. Um, how do we do that? Well, it's really simple. It's declarative, right? Like everything in Kubernetes, um, you just specify a storage class. Um, and in, in our previous example, um, I'm showing that I had set a replication factor. That's what's going to create that replica. Um, we understand your network topology um, so that we're going we're gonna, to uh, place those replicas across racks, availability zones um, in the cloud, um, you know, data centers uh, within, your, within your environment. And make sure that you have kind of your that your network itself provides as much high availability as possible. Um, and that's where you also can set things like uh, security uh, for encryption, um, you know, various performance characteristics like I/O profile and and I/O priority. Um, you know, but that's not it. Uh, we also provide DR for OpenShift. Um, and here uh, we're showing Portworks, a single Portworks cluster stretched across multiple OpenShift clusters. This is the use case that we highlighted with RBC. Um, it's just so easy to get DR in this way. If you remember back, you know, these business continuity projects in the enterprise are both like, you know, soul draining, expensive, and then when you get it all done, they usually fail when, when it comes time to actually do a recovery uh, because they are so complex. Uh, containers take a lot of that guesswork out of, you know, large scale business continuity uh, because, you know, we're shipping our dependencies along with the container. But the data still needs to be in the secondary environment and the application configuration needs to be there as well so that we can spin up our, our new application easily. And Portworx delivers that with a customized or really a turnkey solution for your OpenShift environment. And it's just, it, it look at this. I mean, it enables you to run so many more applications on top of OpenShift. Um, what if your data centers are not in a, um, uh, a local area network or a, um, you know, a metro, we call a metro area sometimes? Uh, well, then you can use asynchronous disaster recovery uh, where we can take in incremental snapshots of those applications and move them between environments. Um, you know, I uh, already talked a little bit about PX Migrate. Um, so the thing that I'll underscore here again is that we are migrating not just your data, but also your application configuration and your Kubernetes objects. You know, things like operators, uh, custom CRDs, uh, controllers, secrets. You know, you can see a list, a, a partial list of all of the different types of YAML files that need to be present in order for your app application to work. And this is a core feature of Portworx across Migrate, Backup, DR, snapshots we're gonna we're gonna take that application configuration as well and that's really unique uh, to Portworx. Um, uh, PF Secure you know what more to say than container granular encryption um, that integrates with your key management store and your um, role-based access control system um, application consistent snapshots so even of distributed databases um, we can make sure that you, you can restore those easily uh, capacity management um, in terms of you know, just rules that say, hey, if, if a volume is running out of stores, then add some more, right, based on based on this policy. Or if um, my entire cluster is running out of uh, of space, well, then add some, add some more cluster capacity. We can actually do that using your cloud APIs, um, using your VMware environment, um, and increasingly using your enterprise storage via our CSI integration. Okay, so I, um, I I told Ryan that I was going to take 15 minutes. I've taken about 20 right now, so I consider that to be actually pretty good um, track record for myself. So I am going to um, end on this slide about our backup and recovery solution uh, for 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 um, uh, for OpenShift, and turn it over to Ryan uh, for a demo portion. And I'll just remind everybody that please put your questions into the um, uh, questions section. Uh, we will answer those um, uh, in either in the course of the demo uh, or um, when we get to the Q&A section at the end. And I see there are already some in there. 
Um, so Ryan, why don't you take it away? And if I can't, um, I can't answer them, we'll, we'll do it live uh, at the end. Okay, that sounds good. Let me just make the presenter myself. Oh, perfect. Going to, yeah, no problem. Okay. So hopefully you can see my screen now. I minimize it. All right, Michael, can you just confirm you can see my terminal? I can see it. Great. All right, let's get started. So uh, today's demo is really going to be about getting uh, getting Portworx Enterprise uh, up and running on OpenShift 4 and um, sort of getting started with some of the features that Michael talked about. We'll go ahead and do some snapshot and restore of a Postgres database. We'll also showcase sort of how autopilot uh, capacity management works at the PVC level. So uh, without further ado, I have a couple of um, a couple of clusters here. And um, one actually already has Portworks installed, but I think it's useful uh, for this uh, today's demo to really uh, dig into what does it look like for um, you to have an OpenShift cluster that you want Portworks to be installed at, uh, and what does that look like, and where do you start? So right now, uh, Portworks is not installed on this cluster. Um, you can we're going to install via the operator. So if I just come over here to the operators, um, you can see Portworks is not installed. Um, and if you head over to our documentation uh, to head over to Portworx on Kubernetes, there's a bunch of sort of before you get, begin information, but if you just kind of scroll down the menu here and go to install on OpenShift, um, you will see Portworx daemon set and operator installations. Uh, we're going to use the operator today, um, and that's because sort of it's a more uh, native and, and sort of way of installing Portworx. I find it a little bit easier to manage. The uh, operator install spec is, is definitely a lot smaller and, and easier to manipulate. So this is where you'd start to um, really get going with the installation. So what we're going to run through is installing the operator itself, deploying the cluster via the operator, and really using Portworx. So the first thing you'd want to do is head over to your operator hub uh, and search for Portworx Enterprise. Um, there, Essentials is available for the free version, but we're going to work with Enterprise here for this demo today. Um, sorry, I just manipulated my windows here a little bit. Um, you click install. I'm going to accept all the uh, defaults, so it'll install a stable version of Portworx into the um, all namespaces available, and um, that is all that's needed. So Portworx Enterprise um, will begin to be installed. Uh, and again, this is just the operator. So at this point, I haven't actually installed Portworx at all. Um, what I've done is install the operator, which gives me the ability to install a storage cluster. Um, so now our operator is up and running. And if you follow through the documentation, you need to deploy um, the actual uh, storage cluster. There's a few prerequisites that I've already done to this cluster. So I'm running in AWS. Um, and so my nodes have the ability to uh, have an IAM policy, which allows me to sort of create volumes, attach volumes. This is everything Portworx does on behalf of the um, admin of that Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so it needs these permissions. Um, and beyond that, it's really just um, you know having some ports open. And my, my cluster is already uh, has that set up. Uh, so what you'll actually wind up doing is uh, going through what we just did, install the storage cluster. But first, you're going to want to head over to uh, central.portworks.com. Um, and this is where you create that spec that defines what your Portworks cluster looks like on your OpenShift cluster. So I'm going to select Portworks Enterprise. Now, if you were working with uh, essentials, you would click essentials. If you're working with backup, you click backup. But today we're going to be working with Portworx Enterprise. Um, note, I did install the operator. So go ahead and click this checkbox and select the operator. I'm going to install our latest 2.7 release. Um, I know my cluster is about five or six nodes. So I'm going to use the built-in KVDB because it's plenty. Um, uh, it's, it's a small enough cluster where that works fine. I know I'm in cloud and I know I'm running on ABS. Um, and in here, you can sort of um, make your cluster look the way you want it to. I'm going to keep the defaults by saying that all my Portworx nodes are going to use a GPT volume in ABS of 150 gigabytes. Um, 
you can optionally minim you can optionally minimize how many storage nodes are in a an availability zone. Uh, you can auto create this journal. Uh, all of these things are pretty um, uh, you know flexible in terms of how you set up your cluster. You may also be running on an instance type that uh, has existing disks, right? And so you can do that. And say if you had MDMEs and stuff on there. But I'm going to use our provisioning technique. Uh, accept the defaults for network interfaces to allow portworks to find them. And uh, a, an important piece is to select this little bullet that says OpenShift 4 um, for your installation mechanism. Uh, if you have a private registry, this is where you put in the secret to access that private registry and details. Um, I'm not going to install PX security, but this you could do that in this fashion here. Um, and what I'm going to make sure and do is enable monitoring because Portworks Autopilot needs monitoring uh, for the sort of autopilot engine to work against your PVC. So that is definitely worth doing. And when you finish, uh, what you'll be left with here is this spec, right? And this spec, let me make it a little bigger, Ooh, not that big, uh, is the storage cluster. So you'll recognize this from your um, uh, window here. That says I, you know, I installed the operator. So here's my storage cluster. I don't have a storage cluster, right? So I need to create one. I'm going to click create. Uh, in this case, you can um, fill out all the information sort of uh, by hand. But the the nice part about the um, spec generator, which we just went through, uh, it does make it all for you. So all you have to do is copy this whole link here. I mean, this whole text. And we're going to come back over here to our YAML file. And I'm just going to replace everything in here. So what this is really saying uh, is I'm creating a storage cluster. Uh, here's my Portworks version. And I'm using this GP2 type 150. I'm installing Prometheus and metrics. Um, and my secrets provider is Kubernetes itself. So it's using the Kubernetes secrets. Um, and when you're ready, you click Create. Um, now, if you're in a different namespace like I just did, you might think, well, I just created it and I don't see it. Well, just make sure you're into the Cube system namespace because by default, that's where Portworks uh, will choose to run. So in this case, I see that my storage cluster is now in the initializing state. Uh, and that is uh, where Portworks comes up. So if you're if you want to get a sense of what's going on, um, you can do it within the OpenShift dashboard itself, which if you prefer, then that works great. So you can head over to pods and see what's going on. Um, Portworks will spin up a number of different pods. Uh, we chose to make sure and install Prometheus and Autopilot. So you'll see Autopilot, you'll see API um, uh, containers. And then the main, uh, the main containers that run Portworks itself, so the SDS layer, are going to be prefixed with px-cluster and a UUID, which is actually what you'll get from your um, PX Central uh, login. So it actually produces this for you, um, which is here's your little uh, px-cluster ID. Um, you, can, you can make that something more readable if you so choose, but automatically we'll create something that looks like that. And that's a good way to identify the uh, the clusters themselves. So the containers will take roughly a couple minutes to come up. Uh, the reason being is because at this point, what Portworks is doing is um, obviously downloading and installing everything it needs to run. Um, but because we also chose to use dynamic provisioning of the backend GP2 volumes themselves that are creating our storage pool, um, it's going to go reach out and perform um, that creation of those volumes, attach them to the uh, uh, VMs and consume them for Portworks themselves. So that does take a minute um, or so. And once we dig in here, uh, we'll go to our terminal. And from this, from any one of these containers, or the node container. Actually, the node container is probably a better one to use because we can use the node binaries natively. I prefer to do it that way. Um, so if you're used to using something called Pixie Cuddle, which is our, C, um, our sort of a CLI tool, you can head over to any one of your worker nodes that you've deployed Portworks to. 
come in here to the terminal um, and uh, let's see, I'm gonna root to use the binaries and then we should have pixie cuddle status available to us. And look at that. So we have, looks like it came up while I was explaining it, but Portworx uh, pixie cuddle status will give you the status of Portworx itself. So here we have one pool across our nodes um, in the US East 2 region. This node happens to be in the availability zone 2A. Uh, the drive on this node is located at this path and we have one, two, three, four nodes in our cluster and a total of 600 gigabytes of storage, which means that our Portworx cluster is up and running on this uh, on this node. So if you want to confirm that within the uh, the operator function that we saw before, uh, you can see here that the cluster is now phase online. So now uh, we're actually ready to use Portworx, right? Um, Portworx is up and running and happily chugging along. Um, you can find some more information about your Portworx cluster um, by using Pixie Cuddle from this terminal, which um, which I'll wind up using a, a few times throughout this demo just to kind of show you what's going on. So one of the things I like to do is Pixie Cuddle service pool show shows you the actual pool um, from a very uh, distinct. So di so status gives you the whole output of what's going on in the cluster. The pool will give you the pool what's going on. Uh, we have no volumes, so Pixie Cuddle volume list will show no volumes. And so let's go ahead and work with Kubernetes itself. So I have some Postgres assets here that I'm going to work with. Um, you know, Michael mentioned that a storage class is always created uh, to, to use Portworx. So here I have a storage class um, with the replication factor to three. This gives me the ability to say that this application Postgres is going to use three replicas uh, uh, IO profile and a priority IO. Um, and then we just have the uh, metadata which defines the application, which is Postgres and the deployment. So let's go ahead and get this up and running. GTL create f oops, Postgres YAML. And that's in the default namespace. So if we head over to our uh, workloads, deployments, go back to default. Uh, here we have Postgres, right? So Postgres is up and running. Uh, let's go to the pod and head over to the terminal here. Um, so I think I should be able to do, yep. So Postgres is up and running. Um, if you wanna see what uh, Portworx volume looks like within the, within the uh, service itself. So you'll, if you do a df-8 switch in the Postgres uh, database, this dev pixie d device is actually what's um, backing bar lib Postgres uh, data. So all the data will reside in here. It's only two gigabytes, but that's sort of on purpose because we want autopilot to do its thing in just a moment. Um, but for uh, the purposes of the demo, I want to add uh, an example, oops, an example database um, to this so let's go ahead and create a test database for our use here. Chris, oh, we need to actually get into there. Create the test database and let's create a table and insert some data. Um, this way when we snapshot and restore our, um, our database later, we'll be able to see that we in fact have the same amount of data. So. Now we have two posts in the test uh, table, um, which we will reference later because uh, we'll do some snapshotting. Uh, but at this point, you now have a database with data in it uh, running in Postgres, um, sorry, running in OpenShift using Portworx. So now let's do something a little more interesting, right? We've done some dynamic provisioning, oh, and um, we might as well, let's go ahead and open a separate, uh, window here to this node because I did want to show you what the volumes actually look like inside of the host itself. And Pixie Cuddle volume list. So before this was empty, uh, now you'll see I have one volume attached 
uh, the PVC name matches the PVC of my Portworks volume, uh, my PVC, if you were to use kubectl, um, which I can show you here, kubectl get PVC, and that's our 2807, ends in 07, that's the same one. Uh, if you wanted more information on what exactly was going on here, you could do a volume inspect um, on that PVC. Uh, this gives you a little more information about the volume itself. So this should all really tie into um, the storage class that you use. So we have um, a replication factor of three. We're on priority IO is high. Our status is up. It's attached on a, this specific node. Um, what's really cool is that Portworks is really integrated tightly with Kubernetes. So we have all these uh, labels that they're sort of, you know, they're aware um, and it's also aware of which volume consumer. So this is the actual Portworks uh, sort of Postgres pod. So from a from a Portworks perspective, we know exactly what's consuming this and, and what pod and all that information, which which makes uh, Portworks a, a, you know able to really detect you know certain failures and things and really um, recover from those as well. We have three replicas that actually will tell you which node those replicas are on. So you know that these three nodes are holding my replicas. Portworks will automatically try to uh, distribute those replicas, um, especially on AWS, it'll it'll use availability zone um, labels, and so it'll put a replica uh, across availability zones to make sure that you know um, your application is protected from a AZ failure at the AWS level as well. So there's a lot of good information that you can find out here. Um, so yeah, now I was a little distracted. So <laughs> um, let's dive into autopilot. Um, so here we have an autopilot rule, and I'm going to show you that what that looks like. So an autopilot rule is a, a specific kind to uh, what Portworks provi provides in Kubernetes. And so um, this actually is saying that I want to match my Postgres application by label. So app equals Postgres. Um, my application happens to have that label. Um, it needs to have that label. Um, you can match it uh, from, you know, other labels as well. Um, and then it will express, in this case, I want to make sure anytime my volume is over 30% used. Now, in reality, in production, you probably want more than 30%. Um, but in this case, I want to make sure that when it hits that 30% threshold, that my action is to resize my PVC. And I want to scale it by 100% uh, with a maximum size of 30. So it puts an upper bound on it. Um, so let's kind of see what this does in action, right? So the first thing we want to do is create, sorry, the autopilot rule itself. This will go ahead and create the rule. Um, what you can do now is kubectl describe, well, you can get autopilot rule. And there's our autopilot rule. We can describe our autopilot rule, uh, Postgres resize, SDP. Um, and what you'll notice here is that our initialization, let me just bring this up the screen a bit, the rule initializes to normal, which basically says that we're, we're within bound, we're within our 30% boundary, and so our rule is considered normal and nothing's going to happen. So now let's perform a little bit of chaos, or not chaos, but a little bit of um, performance testing. So let's create a different database called testDB. And let's come outside and run a, uh, let's, let's load up our database with some data, our testDB with some data. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll run a PG bench test, which will run uh, for you know a certain amount of time. And what it'll do is basically start to fill up our database. And what we expect Autopilot to do is recognize that Portworx is uh, in fact being um, used to a capacity, which our Autopilot rule should be triggered. So let's go ahead and run this. This, I think this runs well for quite a bit of time. Um, but at this point, um, you know, nothing, as, as a user, as an admin, 
you're doing nothing wrong, right? You provisioned some state, maybe you could have provisioned a, a larger PVC, but autopilot's got you covered. So from a user perspective, I'm running a performance test and, um, and maybe these rules are set up automatically by your admin, um, but either way, this rule is actively monitoring this volume. And so um, if we head over back to this uh, volume inspect command, what you'll see here is that our bytes used is gonna start to rise, right? So our volume is starting to be used. We have writes happening. Um, this can also be viewed in Prometheus. It can be viewed in Grafana, which I don't have that Grafana dashboard up, but um, uh, PX monitoring does allow you to see all these metrics in a very graphical way. I'm choosing to do it this way today. Um, but if you just kind of keep refreshing, you can see this, you know, keep going up. So uh, we know our volume is two, two, it actually is four gigabytes in size. It may have, oh, see, see, it actually already happened. And before I could even say anything, it magically went from two gigabytes to four gigabytes um, because autopilot kicked in. So it kicked in faster than I even thought. Um, but what you'll see if you do a describe on that uh, same rule that we did before, it, it was initializing normal and then it went from normal to triggered and then from triggered to active actions pending um, to actions in progress and actions taken. So this means that your autopilot rule is triggered, the action was performed and our volume was increased. Um, so while, we, while I was looking at it, I went from two gigabytes to four gigabytes. And um, meanwhile, our application is still, you know, fine, happy, chugging along, doing its thing with performance testing. Um, and this, uh, this autopilot rule doesn't just stop after the first one, right? My performance test might might throw eight gigabytes of data at this. It might throw five. I forget exactly how, my, how much it actually does here, but it will trigger again. Um, and, and the thing is we put an upper bound of 30 gigabytes. So obviously after 30 gigabytes, if it's going to expand larger than that, um, it would throw an error. So from two gigabytes, we said uh, expand 100%. It'll expand from two to four gigabytes. Then it'll expand from four to eight, eight to 16, and so on. Um, so as that goes on, we'll just let that run. We'll let Autopilot do its thing and we'll check on it a little later. Um, but what we can do in the meantime is also kind of showcase our snapshot and restore mechanism. So from a snapshot perspective, uh, we have a volume snapshot definition here that's very basic, right? So it's just saying, take a snapshot of Postgres data. Um, po uh, Portworks does have the ability to define pre and post rules for, for snapshots. You know, for Postgres, it's a good idea maybe to do a checkpoint um, to make sure everything's synced um, to disk. Uh, in this case, um, you know, I know my data in the table that I wrote before is not really actively being uh, manipulated. so for the purposes of demo purposes, we'll leave the rules out of it, but it is uh, available in our documentation as well. Let's go ahead and create this Postgres snapshot. And there we go. Um, so that's it, right? Um, and now if I head back over to my Pixie Cuddles volume list, I wanna list my snapshots. Here it is, dash S will give you only snapshots if you do volume list, it'll do everything. Um, but you'll see one here, snapshot dash, and it's detached because it's a, it's a instant snapshot of my volume um, um, at the time. And so it's available to be deployed again. So now how hard is it to restore that volume? So PX backup works in a very similar way, obviously just moving you know, data and, and application configuration off, off of the cluster. But from within a cluster, you may want to restore right back for some testing, from testing purposes. So um, what we've done here is kind of proactively come up with this um, uh, other YAML file, which is defining a persistent volume claim, which actually references our snapshot with uh, this little annotation here saying, use the snapshot for my PVC uh, and, it, and it needs to use the stork-snapshot-sc storage class because this storage class will actually do the cloning and and and, and things like that. Um, and again, we define a, a deployment with a slightly different name, but what we're doing is making a clone and restoring it to the application in one simple command here, create Postgres restore. 
And now what we have is a kubectl get pods. We should have, um, well, that's internal debugging, but we have a snap going on here, which is creating. Um, and in the UI, we should be able to head over to my pods or deployments for that matter. We have Postgres snap here. And we have a pod, pod is running, terminal, just like we did before, PSQL, select star from what we have test. No, it was posts. And there's our two posts. So this is a completely different container with uh, using a clone of a post uh, Portworx volume, um, which was taken from our original volume. Um, and so that is, uh, how easy it is to kind of manipulate and take a snapshot and clone up a volume uh, within a cluster and restore it. I restore it to the same namespace, but you can absolutely restore, restore it to a different namespace. Um, and using things like migrations or DR, um, which we showed a little bit of last week, you can do that across clusters in a very similar fashion, move all that uh, you know deployment configuration as well as the volume clone over to an entirely different cluster or cloud or across to OpenShift versions. You know, if you're testing 4.5.7 from 4.5.6, we, um, you know, we can do that as well. Um, let's just see what happened over here. Is anything, look at that, our, our volume expanded once again. So um, we, let's do a little describe on our autopilot rule. Uh, we can see these actions pending taken are now two times over the last six minutes because our um, uh, our volume is still expanding. So PXCTL, oops, kubectl get PVC. We now see that the original volume is two gigabytes in size, um, and that kind of, that autopilot rule will, like I said, will will continue to work. And I'm completely hands off. I'm not resizing things um, within the container itself. If we head back over to our original pod, where's our original pod? Oh, we get the deployment Postgres pod here. Go back here and just do a df dash h. Um, you know, it's it's expanded in the file system as well. I didn't have to you know expand the file system within there. It all happens automatically. Um, we have 10 minutes and I want to make sure, so I, I showed snapshot and restore within the cluster. I showed autopilot. Um, I showed the install of Portworks itself through PX Central. Um, I want to make sure we get to some questions. I just haven't looked yet. So let's take a look. Yeah, well, the, the, audience has been, the audience has been super active on the questions front. Um, I've been awesome. replying to them. So, um, so I, well, we, here's one that we can do live. Um, so does Portworks for OpenShift, um, okay, how, I think how, how does um, um, HA work with Portworks on OpenShift? If yeah. Portworks goes down, um, how how would that work? Yeah, so. You want so to talk area where yeah, I'll, like, I'll talk through it. I, I'll talk through it. And since we got a live demo here, I'm I'm more than happy to, to, to to blow things up for you too. <laughs> um, so our containers, which uh, let's see what our containers are running. So, so the short answer is yes. If a node fails at a, at a node level and Portworks goes down, and you have pods using that, um, you know Portworks configures replicas across other nodes. So what Portworks will do is actually move your workload to another healthy replica, healthy OpenShift node, and your application will continue to work. So to kind of show you what that looks like, um, I can do a get pod um, dash o wide, and we have uh, some of the nodes. Let's see, Postgres is running on. 84. So we'll just use this one, 84. And I'll go over to 204.84. I'll go over here and let's just figure this out. Let's go and find, oops, 204.84. Where are you? Come on. That uh, might be in the wrong cluster. Yep. Wrong cluster. But too many clusters. Um, <clears throat> there we go. 
to a 484. So let's just uh, stop this instance. You know what? I'll just terminate it, show you the worst that happens. We'll just go ahead and blow it up. Um, uh, the, the reason this is also okay is Portworx uses quorum, right? So I have one, two, three, four nodes. If I only had three, then Portworx needs at least three for quorum. So, um, uh, you know, blowing away a third node actually creates a situation where you have to restore quorum. Um, but if you have a lot, you know, you can, you can do something like this to kind of show you what's going on. Um, so what will actually happen for, this is probably easier to see in the UI. In fact, um, here's our Postgres pod. So here, there's, you know, um, it's now at zero, scaling to one, and it's already back up, All right? So that happened pretty quick. I think what we can see is that if I go over here, oh wait, is it on the same node? Is it a different node? Um, Let's see. So I, the ex expectation is is sort of for the pod to um, be rescheduled onto a healthy node because we know when we created our Postgres pod, we had three replicas. So I know that two other replicas are still healthy on another Portworx node. Um, and just trying to figure out which node it belongs on. It's on 84 still. So it may have not recognized that the node was down yet. So um, what we can do is sort of, there we go. It's not ready now. So there's there's some timeouts that need to happen, um, but stork, which is sort of something uh, that, that Portworx brings to the table, will recognize this kind of state and reschedule your, your Portworx pod um, automatically as you get things going. So unless I didn't destroy that, but while that's happening, I'll, I'll wait for that pod to come back online um, or to be moved, I should say. And we'll answer another question. So let's see, the next question was, is this the recommendation? Michael, I that's a follow-up to another question. Maybe I don't, um, I don't know the context of that one. Uh, for the HA one? No, so there's another new question in the q and It says, is this the recommendation? Oh, really? Okay, uh, I, don't, maybe, I don't see that. Maybe whoever asked that out. question can. <laughs> it just says, is, the, is this the recommendation? So uh, maybe you can add a little context. Oh, yeah, that was, sorry, I answered that one. Yeah, that was, uh, okay, that was a question about um, backup. And uh, just to, so everybody else is probably curious now. Um, the question was, do Port, do Port Works backup live on the same cluster? Um, and I said they can, uh, but they don't have to. And in fact, most customers, they wouldn't for obvious reasons, right? If you lose your entire cluster, you don't also want to lose your backup. Um, so the word backup is not a technical term, right? It's a, ter it's a term that we use to describe how do we protect our data. And with Port Works, there are a number of ways um, that you can do backups, right? You can just take a snapshot and you can store that in the cluster and some other cluster, but just your data volumes. Um, when you use PX backup, which is our product, there you're going to be capturing all of your data volumes as well as your application configuration. And that's going to be stored in any S3 compatible object store. So this would be an example of where we're storing off the cluster um, and not on a secondary cluster, it's just in an object store, right? So really low cost um, uh, storage. And if you lose your entire cluster, well, you can bring your cluster back using, you know, using Kubernetes or Terraform or CloudFormation or whatever it is you use to bootstrap your Kubernetes environment. And then Portworx can restore your applications from that, that backup that's sitting on, on S3. Um, and again, that's going to be all your data as well as your application configuration. So restores really quick. Um, we also do DR, where we're going to synchronously replicate data between environments. So you would have a secondary uh, OpenShift cluster that's live and running um, in case you lose your initial your your first data center, and then you can fail over very quickly. That's RPO uh, zero disaster recovery. We can also do asynchronous disaster recovery over a wide area network. Um, so the is that the recommendation? Uh, what I said to that is 
well, it kind of just depends on your use case and your business requirements. And what's really nice is that it's on an app by app basis. So a lot of storage solutions will configure policies like that at the storage pool layer, which means that any, anything that's consuming that storage pool is going to have the same policies associated with it. But like, that's not how Kubernetes works, right? You, any app with any number of requirements could be running in the same cluster. And so you want to be able to apply backup security uh, migration policies on an app by app basis. And that's what Fullworks delivers. So thank you, Michael. So in the background, um, what happened was my my pod was failed over to a healthy node. Uh, my data is still there. So this is me running uh, the select command in the new recovered pod. Uh, in the details, I showed that it's now on uh, 191.144. It was on 204.84 before. Um, and um, Portworks automatically rescheduled that to a healthy node. Uh, and what you'll actually see Oh, or can, um, what you'll actually see from a Portworks perspective, if I head back over to the terminal here, loading, loading, is that one node of your Portworks cluster will um, report that it's down. And that's because I um, I just terminated it. Um, so Pixie Cuddle, also not recommended to just terminate a, a node. Um, but at this point, you would decommission this node uh, because it's completely gone. Um, but the, the good thing is, is that that, P that volume that we were working with, our Postgres volume, uh, which is this guy here, uh, Pixie Cuddle Volume Inspect, this one, um, it's, it's in a degraded state at this point. So to your point, what happens? Um, this replica here is, now in a, uh, it's basically saying, I can't access this replica. And so after a certain amount of time, Portworks will say, uh, okay, this replica is officially gone, right? There's basically a timeout and it'll, and it'll sync it to a healthy node. Um, but it will try to wait originally in case that node's rebooting or you put it in maintenance mode or something like that where the replica may be down. Um, but at this point, it's sort of in that, in that, um, um, in that mechanism of waiting. Um, and, but there's two other full healthy replicas, which our pod is using um, and the data is available on, which uh, was that select command before. So in that case, that's how AJ works uh, from a node level, Portworx level, uh, your from your application perspective, it'll just restart and come back up, your data will remain. Um, and better you know it's better if your application itself so postgres or, or mysql or mongo is you know distributed so it may have more than one node so that it's not you know a single pod that has to be restarted it depends on sort of your needs and things like that but that's what it looks like in in that uh failure scenario one minute left so we got a few more questions uh, a few more questions can you show portworks for container roadmap in session uh we I do not have time for Okay. I was replying to that one. It's it's too much to do in the last minute. So um, yeah. uh, why don't you reach out to us? Just follow up. Um, just go to our website and there's a form at the top. I think it says contact us or at the bottom. Um, and just reach out to us and we're happy to share with you what's on the roadmap and how it can apply specifically to your environment. Yeah. Uh, for all the people yeah. that are looking for the uh, recording, yep, it'll be available. Um, and I think all the other questions have been answered. I saw one more, which is the demo showed Snapshot and Restore, and this was done on EBS. It's actually Snapshot and Restore is done at the Portworx volume level. Uh, EBS happens to be used under it, but um, Portworx can use any underlying storage, so it's direct attached storage or uh, SAN, that kind of thing. Um, the question is, can the same be done for block to object and back to block storage? Um, so right now, Portworx doesn't, um, doesn't support using object underneath, but we can absolutely snapshot to an object storage. So that's called cloud snap. I didn't show it today, but you can use an object storage to cloud snap to an object storage um, offsite and then restore basically just with the same workflow that I showed, but using that cloud snap instead of a local snapshot. So that will offload the storage space. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, there is a public Slack. Um, or Discord. So um, I know we're a little over time, but I'm going to try slack.port. 
Slack.fortworks.com. You can you can go there and uh, yep. talk to us on the public Slack. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks everybody for your time. This was awesome, Ryan. Great demo. Um, and very active audience. Thank you so much for asking questions. That makes it a lot more entertaining. Um, and you know, some of them were I had to think a little bit. How would we do that? Um, and that's I think the the thing which isn't captured in a webinar like this is that there are so many options. You know, when you say, how do you do backup? Well, how, like, how do you want us to do backup? Because your application, your network topology, what you're running um, are all different. And so I think this webinar is a great first step, but I would highly encourage you, if you have follow-up questions, right, don't wait for the next monthly demo to ask them. Uh, just con put, it, put in a contact us form. Like within hours, you're gonna have someone who's returning your phone call trying to learn more about what you're doing and so we can schedule a call with you so we can truly dive into your apps and your environment and help you figure out how to um uh how to get the most out of openshift so thank you so much uh until next time uh have a great day and thanks ryan and um talk to you next time see ya